I'm speaking with Professor David Baltimore of the California Institute of Technology and 1975 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine. Thanks for joining me today, David. Pleasure. Our little chat is part of a chapter on reverse transcription and integration. And before we get to that, I'd like to hear a little bit about where you were born and raised and educated. Born in New York Hospital. <laughs> wow. Uh, then my parents moved to Great Neck, actually, when I was in grade school. Mm -hmm. And I went off through the Great Neck public schools. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful schools in those days. Still, I think, wonderful. Um, and went to Swarthmore College. Um, actually, during my senior year, uh, between my junior and senior years of high school, I went to the Jackson Lab in Bar mm -hmm. Harbor, Maine, at my mother's discovery of this opportunity for high school students. And it changed my life because I suddenly saw, A, that I, a not particularly knowledgeable high school student, could do experiments at the, at the edge of knowledge and learn something new. It wasn't particularly important what I learned, but I could do mm -hmm. it. And that was the most satisfying thing I could imagine doing in life. And it's what I've been doing ever since. So at that point, you were already interested in a career in science? Well, all I knew at that point was that science came easy to me. I see. Mathematics and science. And so it was the most rewarding thing in school mm -hmm. because I sort of stood out from everybody else. And I wasn't a jock. I wasn't particularly social. I mean, the <laughs> only thing I had going for me was I could do math in my head. Um, and so... And my mother was very conscious of that. Mm. She was an experimental psychologist. And so she saw this thing on a bulletin board at the new school where she was working uh, and came home and said, you want to mm -hmm. go for the summer? And I applied and they accepted me. Was it to work on mice? Because it's the Jackson it's, Lab. Yeah, it was all mice. Yeah. Um, I worked with three investigators, um, world famous people, Don Bailey, uh, Tibby Russell and um, and Willie Silvers, um, three of the most important people in, in mouse genetics. Uh, and here I was just a kid. Mm. And they gave me little things to do. I remember for Don Bailey, I measured the length of bones. Uh, but for you, that was terrific, right? But it was terrific. It was amazing because <laughs> you, you, you were connecting to yeah. big questions in science. You had reason to go to lectures to read things. Um, mm. So then I went back to high school and made my way through and then went to Swarthmore, which was a great experience, but wasn't terribly forward looking in biology. Um, and so uh, I would go in summers and, and do research mm -hmm. at Mount Sinai um, and ultimately at Cold Spring Harbor. And that then connected me to modern molecular biology which at that point was still pretty rudimentary. We're talking about 19, 1959. Um, mm -hmm. But I started doing phage work and thinking about recombination and doing what was then the current thing to be doing. Um, Did you take the phage course at Cold Spring Harbor? No, I didn't. I, well, I was yeah. uh, just a, a, an undergraduate. Um, but the, all the phage course people were there. I went to all the phage course lectures. Mm -hmm. um, Al Hershey was there. And right. I worked with George Streisinger. Um, did you meet Sal Luria there? I, I did. Um, I met Luria and Leventhal right. and Delbrook and all of the, the great people of the time. This is great for a high school student, a college student. A college student, student yeah. Still right. great. It was just great. And Luria and, and, and um, Leventhal were talking with George Streisinger, and George said I was doing a good job and it would be interesting to have me as a graduate student. So they were just starting the graduate program in molecular biology at mm -hmm. MIT that fall, and they invited me to come. So I never applied anywhere else, I just went to MIT because of that, that experience. Mm -hmm. And it was fabulous, and, and Luria was, was really my mentor from, from that then until he died. Um, and he, uh, so I went to him as I was a first year graduate student. And I said, 
you know, I'm working with Phage, and it's fine, but Phage is what you guys have been doing now for a long time. And we have this whole exciting world of mammalian biology, mm. which I had been exposed to at the Jack's lab, and particularly with mice. And I said, I wonder if there's a way into eukaryotic biology that would enable you to begin to do things that you can do so well with, with bacteria and bacteriophage. And they said, they had no idea. But I said, how about animal viruses? Because animal viruses, and Luria had written about animal viruses in his book. So he was quite aware of, of the range of animal viruses and stuff, although we didn't know much about their molecular biology. And so Luria said, I'll tell you what, I'll arrange for you to take the animal virus course at Cold Spring Harbor this summer. And before that, you can work with a very quantitative animal virologist, Phil Marcus, who just passed away, mm -hmm. um, in, uh, at, at Albert Einstein, where Phil was at the time. And so I went and worked with Phil and did, in fact, very quantitative work and uh, counting cells and plaques and whatever else. And then went and took the Cold Spring Harbor course. And it was taught by Richard Franklin mm -hmm. and, and Ed Simons. And I just thought Richard was in the exactly right position to do what I wanted. So Luria kindly, after having gotten me to MIT, recommended me to Rockefeller where Richard was. Mm. And I moved to Rockefeller that fall and did my thesis in two years at Rockefeller because I just walked into animal virology at a time when nobody knew anything. And every day I could make a discovery, <laughs> publish a paper. It was, it was such a joy. That kind of opportunity in science comes very yeah. rarely. You worked on mango virus and polio virus. Yeah, right? I worked on mango, which is a relative of polio. And, and then they were working on polio in Igor Tom's lab, so mm -hmm. I would sort of took it over into polio. Right. So, and after you finished your PhD at Rockefeller, where yeah. did you go next? At, for my PhD, I actually discovered the, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of poliovirus, mm -hmm. of mango virus. Um, and to do that, I did in vitro biochemistry. But I was doing it not only without a license, without any, any idea what I was doing. Uh, I got a lot of help from Dan Nathans, actually, who was then a postdoc with uh, Fritz Lippmann. Mm -hmm. And he just showed me the moves and what to think about. And then I wrote a paper, and, um, and Jerry Hurwitz, who was at, then at, at NYU, um, helped me put it in a form in which a, a working scientist would recognize mm. that I knew what I was talking about. Uh, and so when I finished my thesis, uh, I um, went for a year to, to um, um, MIT, back to MIT, worked with Jim Darnell. Mm -hmm. But Jim decided then to leave and go to Einstein. So um, I had to figure out what to do. And I said, you know, I'm going to get some real training in biochemistry. And so I um, went and worked with Jerry mm -hmm. Hurwitz, also at Einstein then, um, for a year. And Jerry and I agreed that we disagreed mm -hmm. about <laughs> what we wanted to do. Jerry, Jerry is, of course, a, um, an inveterate in vitro biochemist. Yeah. Um, and at that point, he wasn't even uh, thinking much genetically. Mm -hmm. I mean, later, he, he got a little more involved. Uh, so I uh, worked with Jerry. And during that time, um, Renato Del Becco came to New York and looked me up, because I'd met him once before and said, I'm starting a lab at, at the Salk Institute. Uh, he, was at, he was then at Caltech, mm. but he was moving to the Salk Institute. And uh, would you like to come join me? And uh, seemed mm. like too, and he said, you know, I have grant money, you, can, don't, you don't have to worry about that, mm. you get, get a position there, and have a piece of my lab. You don't have to work with me, you don't even have to work on things I care about. So all, of, it, all of which doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so I said, you know, with that, that was too good an opportunity. Mm -hmm. and, and I 
literally never been to California. I guess I'd been to California once by then. So uh, I went there and we worked in the temporary buildings at Salk uh, mm -hmm. until the, the Louis Kahn masterpiece opened um, and then we moved in there. And I did that for a couple of years. And uh, I, I got a little itchy with the, the um, sort of uncertainty of working in a new institution that didn't have any procedures in place. And I didn't know where my life was going because there was no tenure track, there were no mm -hmm. positions for young people. And so when Luria said, come back to MIT, I said, you know, that would be a pleasure to walk into a situation where everything is fixed and you know what you need to do and there are people, you know, who's gonna help you. And, and it worked out terrifically well. So I got there in 68. And um, all that time I'd been working on polio virus mm -hmm. in one way or another. Um, and in 69, Alice Wong and I had gotten married. Uh, she was working in my lab as mm -hmm. a postdoc and had spent much of her career working on vesicular stomatitis virus before she joined me. And so I said, you know, maybe I ought to branch out in virology a little. Uh, let's have a look at VSV. Mm -hmm. And so she and I and a student, Martha Stanford, got together and, and, and uh, worked on VSV along with polio and whatever else was going on. Um, and we quickly discovered that it was carrying the negative strand, not the positive strand in the, in the virion. And that was the discovery of negative strand viruses. Um, and that was the beginning of the discovery of the reverse transcriptase because I, it occurred to me, you just have to think through the logic actually of a negative strand virus, it's got to have a polymerase in the virus particle. It's the only way it can get the whole mm -hmm. process going. So I looked in the virus particle. The one thing I knew how to do was polymerase biochemistry. And, um, and so I just treated it like an enzyme. And there it was. So what you, you learned for VSV, a negative strand virus, that the polymerase is in the particle. Right. What got you interested in retroviruses then? So we quickly showed that all negative strand viruses had this property, except flu. Flu was recalcitrant, because we didn't know about capsnatching. Okay. And so we couldn't get the flu polymerase to get started. Right. right. Uh, but we did know, we did NDV, and then it was just obvious that this was a general principle. Okay. So I began to think about what viruses don't we understand? And the outstanding virus that we didn't understand were, were the retrovirus, now called retroviruses, then called RNA tumor viruses. Mm -hmm. um, and they did present this puzzle, which is that they could transform cells, they could make the cells permanently into cancer cells, and yet they were RNA. And RNA, particularly at that time, we didn't think of as a molecule that had permanence, mm -hmm. uh, in, at least in the cellular context. Mm -hmm. And so Howard Temin had said, even 10 years before that, there's a DNA intermediate in the growth of this virus. And so I said, well, either it looks like the negative strand viruses, because right. we didn't know it was negative or positive. Right. Or it looks like, the, or maybe it makes DNA. So I first actually assayed for an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase when I got a stock of virus. Mm -hmm. Could find nothing. And then switched to looking for a DNA for DNA synthesis, and after about two days of work, there it was. <laughs> um, Why did you switch to a DNA enzyme? Well, because Howard had been talking about okay. it, there being a DNA intermediate, and there had to be some way for this virus to grow. Yeah, okay. Now, when you were at Rockefeller previously, had you interacted with Peyton Rouse at all? Because you worked with his I, virus, right? I did know Peyton Rouse. Um, Actually, the virus I used for most of the work, I did a little with Rouse sarcoma virus, mm -hmm. but the virus I used most was Rauscher murine okay. leukemia virus, um, just because I could get a big stock of that from NCI. Um, but I, I did know Rouse because in the days of, those days at Rockefeller, we all ate lunch together, mm. and the students were, be, were treated like faculty. 
So we ate lunch with the faculty, and they had those communal tables at Rockefeller. And so you walked in and sat down next to anybody. And I had the occasion to sit down next to Rouse, talk mm -hmm. about with him a little bit. Um, a very personable and, uh, and interesting man who had discovered Rouse sarcoma virus yeah. in 1911 and then never worked with it again. Hmm. Um, and was really very much down on the virus uh, theory of cancer. Um, and other people had found other viruses in the intermediate time, but he was working on chemical carcinogens. He wasn't working mm -hmm. on viruses. So he was alive when you discovered the reverse transcriptase. No, I think not. Okay. I think not. It's too bad, he would have liked that. Right, <laughs> right. He got, well, no, wait a minute now. He got the Nobel Prize in 66, but I don't know how long, much longer he lived. I'm not, I just don't okay. remember. Never, never thought about the question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, after discovering the RT, what, tell us what kinds of things it led to in your lab. Well, it led to a lot of biochemistry mm -hmm. because I wanted to know, I mean, the first question everybody asked is, is this a class of viruses causing human cancer? Right. And since we knew very little about human cancer, that was... A, a very important question. Now, I did a little bit of reading uh, said that cancer didn't have the properties of an infectious process. And it, of course, we now know that for most cancers, that's true. It doesn't. And still, we, we wanted to know maybe there was a, a role for viruses, mm -hmm. or maybe it was hidden away and you couldn't see yeah. it in the epidemiology. Um, so we needed a good assay for reverse transcriptase. And so the first thing I did was to find out whether we could copy homopolymers because you can make those in large amounts and use them as substrates. And we quickly showed that it was a primer-dependent enzyme, like DNA polymerases all are, uh, in that you could give it a poly-U template, it wouldn't copy it, but you gave it an oligo-DA primer, right. and now the primer started the synthesis going, and then it copied it beautifully. And so you could, particularly with poly, G, poly G oligo DC, mm -hmm. or the vice versa, forgotten now, uh, you could get huge amounts of incorporation of radioactivity. Everything was being done by mm -hmm. radioactivity then. And that meant you had a very sensitive assay for this enzyme. It was very easy to see. Um, and so we started developing, looking at human tumors and stuff. I couldn't find anything. Mm -hmm. now, as you know, other people uh, said they found things, and all of those things have died. Not one of them has been reproducible. Right. Right. But there was a huge literature by that time, of people who said they had it. Um, and they were kidding themselves, I think. So we, we did that. Second thing we did was, Inder Verma had come to my lab um, from uh, Israel, actually, and he was going to work on VSV. That's what he, he wrote his program for. And I said, Andrew, why don't you just spend a little time and see whether it'll copy a messenger RNA? And so we knew messenger RNAs had 3' poly A, and so you could prime it with an oligo DT. Mm -hmm. And the question was, where do you get messenger RNA? Well, it was lucky that at, at MIT, there was a group a guy, with a guy named um, Gary Temple um, that was isolating messenger RNA from reticulocytes, globin messenger RNA. Mm -hmm. And so we got a little bit of globin messenger RNA and showed very quickly that you could prime it with oligo-DT and make a reverse transcript of the message. And that was, of course, the first cDNA. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, we uh, got very excited about the ability to do that. And in fact, the hematology department at Children's Hospital in Boston all came through the lab to learn how to do these things mm. uh, because they were particularly interested in globins. So there was, you know, there was the chance. Um, and industry took it over. Right. And we never patented any of this. Mm. Um, I've sort of rude that fact, mm -hmm. um, but I think it also was uh, 
it facilitated yeah, for sure. the spread of it, and that was great. Uh, so the, the two big things that we did were, were assay. I mean, never mind the working on the biochemistry of the enzyme. Uh, but it wasn't until much later that probably the biggest uh, discovery to come from the reverse transcriptase, which was that HIV was, was a retrovirus. The HIV existed, for mm -hmm. that matter, and was a retrovirus. Was done not by us, but right. by other people. When I came to your lab in 1979, I know you were studying the mechanism of reverse transcription, the strong yeah. stop minus DNA <laughs> and the jumps and the tRNA right. primary. So that's another thing that you right. So we we wanted to understand how reverse transcription happened, right? Um, and ultimately, although we didn't work on it, how integration occurred, and. Mm. A, a little look at the virus, and it was really unclear how it, how it could reproduce itself. It was fine to do biochemistry and get incorporation of, of radioactive triphosphates right. into DNA, but uh, the actual mechanics were were very interesting. And so, yeah, we worked on that all through the 70s. And finally, I guess Ellie Gilboa um, put the nail in the coffin, mm -hmm. and we published that paper that was a mixture of theory and mm -hmm. experiment that laid out all those little jumps and stuff. And then at that time, sequencing began to be developed so you could start to look right. at the RNA, compare it to proviral DNAs as right. well and see the differences. And right, so and see the re repetitive ends. Yeah. Repetitive ends were the key to right. figuring out how things happened. So what, uh, what's exciting you in your laboratory these days? Well, I, um, I've been doing administrative work now for many years. I ran the Whitehead Institute. I was at Rockefeller as president, then at, mm -hmm. at Caltech as president. So over 20 years, um, I was doing a lot of administrative work. And when I stepped down at Rockefeller, I kept, of course, a lab going all that time, and we did a range of things, mostly in immunology. Uh, but um, I said when I stepped out as president, as a sort of swan song in life, <laughs> um, maybe I should do something different. And I had had a terrific young student, Lily Yang, who developed a very simple capability, which was to put the two chains of the T cell receptor in a vector and get it to express in T cells and uh, reprogram T cell specificity mm -hmm. by Repro by, by using defined T cell receptors. She, was, she developed this because we wanted to do mouse experiments. But in the end, that was her thesis. And when we were all done, we realized that this could actually be done in humans. And you could use this, for instance, to reprogram T cells mm -hmm. so that they would attack tumor cells. And that was the genesis of a program that I called, I still call, engineering immunity in the lab. Engineering immune cells to have new specificities, new capabilities, um, and we wanted to do that with T cells. We wanted to do the same thing with B cells, mm -hmm. where the target was HIV. We wanted to do a variety of things. Then serendipity helped along the way, and we found some other interesting right. translatable targets. Um, the end result of that is that we started two startup companies, both of which are, are moving along, one of which actually is very well funded uh, right now. Uh, both of them have ongoing clinical trials, uh, one in, in cancer and one in HIV. And then we have two other programs, um, one in, in, in HIV uh, protection, not not uh, therapy, mm -hmm. and one in, in um, another cancer program, uh, which I'm doing jointly with people at UCLA. And so we have four clinical programs going, three of which are treating patients, one of which is now in the, on the verge of treating patients. Uh, it's a little hard to imagine mm -hmm. how successful that that impetus to 
to um, modify the immune system has, has been. So you've been in science a long time. I sure have. You've seen a lot of things change. Maybe you could give us a, an idea of how technology has changed in ways that help you. Well, technology has, as long as I've been in science, which is, let's say, 1960 to today, mm -hmm. just about every five years, there are major changes in technology that allow you to do things that you previously either said, which is too hard or, or, yeah. or there's no way to do them, or which you hadn't imagined you could ever do. I mean, like sequencing was something, I must say, I never imagined right. we'd be able to do in the way we can do it now. But, you know, I started out in 1960. There were no restriction enzymes. There was no reverse transcription. There was no uh, uh, sequencing right. methodology. Uh, so all of that had to come along. But the first things that came along that made huge differences were the sucrose gradient. Mm -hmm. That's why I went to Jim Darnell's lab, mm -hmm. was to use that. And, and um, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Just the ability to separate molecules right. using various forces <laughs> on the molecules. And separation was the name of the game for, for the period from 1960 to 1970. Um, and then in 75, uh, I'm skipping various things, but okay. in 75 came uh, recombinant DNA technology. Right. That was the biggest thing, the biggest single change. Because now you could do what I wanted to do in 1960, which was to use all of the techniques that come out of bacterial uh, molecular biology right. to attack right. eukaryotic biology. Right. And that had not been possible until we could cut and splice DNA, put it into bacteria, grow it up, uh, move it around, and now, of course, we can do all of that in mammalian cells with mammalian vectors. Um, and so that mm. was totally revolutionary. Now, we had to deal with the problem that this was so revolutionary that we didn't know what dangers it might have. And although time has shown that we can control the dangers pretty easily, uh, at the beginning we didn't have any idea where we could, and that, that's what led to the Asilomar meeting um, in 75. And so we set in process a, an ability to, to do certain kinds of experiments because prima facie, they seem not at all dangerous, and to begin to do experiments that might have some inherent danger, yeah. keep an eye on them, see what was going on. That was all overseen by the National Institutes of Health. Um, and that process worked extremely well um, because it was that, that remarkable a change in technology. Uh, and then, uh, since then, sequencing has gotten better and better and better, and now cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and cloning methodologies, all these companies that have sprung up. So you buy, your students today want to do something, they buy a kit from someplace, they don't even understand what the KM, KM of an enzyme is. Right. Uh, <laughs> but they do uh, know how to follow yeah. directions on a kit. Yep, that's how it is. So of, every, of all the things that you've done in your career, which, which would you point as contributing the most to the field? Well, I think the reverse transcriptase has to be that because it changed our, our view of cancer. It made cancer a tractable problem. Yeah. And up to then, cancer was an intractable problem. I mean, in, in 1970, when, I dis, when we discovered the reverse transcriptase, um, we, there was not an agreement that cancer was a genetic process. And the, knowing about the reverse transcriptase opened up the ability to analyze ras sarcoma virus. Mm -hmm. And so, so uh, um, Mike Bishop and Harold Varmus could find that the cancer-inducing properties of RAS mm -hmm. came from a modified cellular gene. And suddenly we linked viruses mm -hmm. and cells. And so that, so I think I can take some credit for, mm -hmm. for getting that going in the right direction. And, and it's been remarkable. And then the ability to identify HIV uh, was from a societal point of view incredibly important because it 
it didn't necessarily tell us anything about mechanism, but it told us about ideology. Right. And so all of the crazy ideas that people had, blaming homosexuals for, the, for their own disease and whatever, uh, was all uh, put to rest, should have been, I mean, except for a few crazies, um, by, uh, by the knowledge that it was a virus. Right. We, know, we knew the class of viruses. By that time, we had 10 years of experience with retroviruses, so we know a lot about them. Do you have any advice for young people today who want to be scientists? Yeah, I think I do, but I must say that it is such a different world that mm -hmm. my view of what people should do uh, and their view of what they should be doing is often pretty different. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not going to, I don't want to become an old curmudgeon insisting <laughs> that we did it right and nobody else since then has done it right. Uh, but uh, science has become much more professionalized. When we got into science, even when you got into science, we, nobody else in the society cared that much about it. And we had to be entirely inner driven. Mm -hmm. to do it. Today there are all sorts of forces out there driving people into science because you know it's a good profession, you know there's a real advancement ladder in it, you know how it works, um, and there's a lot of government money, of mm -hmm. course less and less, but um, still relatively, in the, particularly in the United States relative to other countries, still a lot of money. Um, and you're working for society, so it's, it's a morally positive um, occupation. Whereas if you take your mathematical ability and go into hedge funds, um, your moral status in the world is not as high, let us say. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, and you know, it's what what mothers and fathers want for their kids if they don't go to medical school. <laughs> right. uh, and in fact, the linkage between medical school and, and research now is so tight with the MD-PhD program mm. that uh, it, it even is uh, okay to go to medical right. school. Right. I understand you like to fish. I do. Why do you like fishing? Well, I like to do things which are absorbing, and mm -hmm. fishing is absorbing. There's the kind of fishing we do. I mean, you can go out in a lake and throw a lure in and, and, and you know, wait until a fish hits it and take right. it in. And then many people enjoy it and drink a lot of beer. <laughs> um, but you can go to a stream where the fish are hiding away in little pockets, and you've got to read the water and figure out how you get your fly down there into just that right spot where the fish mm -hmm. are going to That takes a lot of practice and a lot of, of understanding um, and is totally absorbing. Sounds like a science also. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's certainly um, analytic, yeah. So a colleague of mine, Dixon de Pommier, is a big fisherman. He sent yeah. me a gift for you. Oh. Which I think you will appreciate. You, you probably recognize this. I do. That's a fly box. There you go. So there's some flies in there. And I'll read to you. You wrote a little note um, about these flies. He said, uh, David, please accept these flies from an ardent fisher. They were purchased from the Winnie and Walt Daddy Fly Shop in Roscoe, New York. Joe Fox, their great grandson, now runs the shop. And this pattern, O Sable Wolf, two number 16 yep. and two number 18, is a killer, especially on the Missouri. I have used it all over the world, and the only locale I have not had success with it was the North Island of New Zealand. I will use them very soon. I will be on the Missouri. Here's a note from Dixon. Great. I will be on the Missouri in <laughs> a few days, and I will. Well, enjoy. This is a nice box, too. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for talking with me today. I've been speaking with Professor David Baltimore of the California Institute of Technology. Thanks so much. Thank you.